Hi there, Neil Clark here of Falkirk Piping, www.falkirkpiping.com A bit of a landmark this video, this is lesson number 21 in our How to Learn the Bagpipe series and it will feature the most often played pipe tune in the world, the Green Hills of Tyrol. Not the best played pipe tune in the world, but certainly the most often played pipe tune in the world. I did a bit of searching and, and, and the decision as to what tune I would put in as number 1500 on the, the video channel and I thought well uh, this particular tune is the most often played tune uh, in the world, no question about it. So let's make it this one and let's make a stab at helping people to play it properly. So quite a few versions of this, the general tune remains the same. This particular version is taken from Scots Guards Book 1. Very, very widely available. Not going to say it's the best version, but it's certainly widely available. We have up until now stuck to three books. The College of Piping, Tutor Book 1, the National Piping Centre book, and Robert Wallace's book. But in this case, we'll use the Guards version. I would also ask you, and I'm going to do another video on this somewhere else, to please, if you're benefiting from this channel, which some of you no doubt are, would you consider please donating to Parkinson's UK? I have family reasons for asking this, and uh, it would be very much appreciated if you perhaps considered donating any amount at all, no matter how small, it will all be appreciated. Um, on with the tune now. Very brief background to the tune. This is on page 226 of Scots Guards Book 1. In the index it's listed under Retreat Marches, not 3-4 Marches. We believe that uh, the British military or the Scottish military came across this tune in the Crimean War. Around about 1854 it was taken from the playing of an Austrian brass band. The reason it is so famous is in the 1950s a Scottish singer called Andy Stewart put words to this and it's known to the non-piping public as the Scottish soldier. A lot of sentiment involved in the tune. There's also a little bit of uh, theory disagreement going with the tune in that the first two notes should actually be out with the tune. Well, these people are probably right that talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to dispute that in the slightest, but guess what? I don't care. I'll show you how to play the tune. Uh, in the Gars book, I believe, certainly in my version, uh, the two introductory notes are actually contained within the first bar. Please just ignore the slight theory mistake. It doesn't make any difference to the way that the pipers actually perform it. This tune has several different, slight differences, several different versions. In this version, for instance, there are no terluths. It's about time I played it for you. The first part goes like this. of the differences in the tune come in the last bars in each line and certainly the last bar uh, of the part itself. The first part is repeated, the second part That last uh, last bar there may differ, differ somewhat in the length of the notes. However, the tune's pretty recognisable regardless of the, the version that you hear. It is a 3-4 march. It's quite a long march. It's almost invariably followed by the tune the battle's over. So much so that I believe uh, some people will think they're actually the same tune. 
Anyway, let's have a wee look at uh, actually playing the thing. Um, the first beat, believe it or not, should come in the C, but don't, uh, please don't spend too much time deliberating over that. It doesn't make any difference to the way we actually play the tune. What we have in the first phrase... <laughs> Which takes us up to the strike on the E in bar 2. There was a soldier, a Scottish soldier, goes pretty well with the actual notes. G grace note to A to start the tune, a connecting note of B, solidly down to a low G for the grip to C. Doubling on C, following E grace note down to low A, G grace note to C, Back down to low G for that throw on D, a doubling on E, and a strike on E. Playing that again for you, holding that first low A, now as you can see there, the B, the second note in the tune is quite a short note. We still have plenty time to get down to the low G and perform a proper and full grip on the C. After the second C, the C doubling, it's an E grace note down to low A. One more time with that phrase. In the next phrase we're up and down from the top hand to the bottom and we have doublings and another grip, this time on B. The B grips that you heard there in certain versions of this tune will be a full terlueth, in this case it's just the grip. Be aware that your version may contain the full terlueth. So, again from that F. Lots of long notes in there. At the start of the phrase we have the F, the doubling to C, proper doubling, C double, G grace note followed by a D grace note on C. Back to F, doubling on E, Joining note of C, G grace note to B, a grip to B, up to F again, doubling to E, travelling note, joining note of C, and then from the C, closing down to low G, briefly before coming back to the low A. Make sure you go down to that low G before returning to the A. The first line then. It's a reasonably slow tune, never heard it go particularly fast. Please hold these long notes. Even the general public throughout the world know how this tune is meant to be played because they've heard it so many times. So hold these long notes or the whole world will know you're not getting it right. The second line is almost a carbon copy of the first with the exception of the last bar. So taking you through the whole line... <laughs> So, we go all the way through the, through the line to the B grip. After the B grip, things change. Instead of going up to the F, as we did in line 1, after the B grip, we close to low G briefly, coming up to low A, doubling on C, connecting note of B, closing down to low G and back to A again. Let's have a look at it from that B grip, which should be in the last bar. 
That's your difference. In some versions you'll find a rodin, which is... In this version there's no rodin. Playing B, close down to low G and come up to A. Let's have a look at that second line again then. So, that's the first part, which is actually the hardest part in the tune. This version is not the most complicated version that you're going to hear off this tune. In fact, it's slightly simpler than the version I would normally play myself. I would like to put the Terluiths in. However, we have to stick to some sort of score. This is, again, in Scott Scar's book 1, page 226. The full first part goes... <laughs> the first part done and dusted, please take the time to, 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 to actually play this tune properly. Um, I, I, this is about the third time I've said this, but it is the most common tune in the world. It is also the most badly played tune in the world. Um, so to take the time, play, whatever your version, please play it, play it properly. Part two is generally easier than part number one. We have some nice long notes, particularly on high A. There is a little trap in uh, part two, which I'll show you, uh, and I'll also show you how to avoid falling into the trap, which is false fingering. Anyway, the second part is this. Splitting it up into phrases. The first phrase. <laughs> For those green hills are not my land's hills, according to Andy. And um, to take you through it, doubling on C, up to E, both played evenly, high A and a strike, or high A doubling, depending on what your terminology, the terminology is. Uh, that, that strike comes in immediately. <laughs> Followed, we hold that high A for one beat and we strike the A again, holding this second A for another beat. Coming off the A, an F grace note up to high G. F and a doubling on F, E and a strike on E. <laughs> Practice coming from the E to the high A and the immediate strike. Make sure you get that in time. Um, don't rush it but the strike must come in immediately and we hold that high A for a full beat after it. Now, the next line is where the, the, the temptation to false finger comes in. What we have is... So we have a G grace note to a held E, a connecting note of an F before a doubling on E, a D and a G grace note light strike, that's just down to the C, uh, that's a D strike, sorry. Next we come to the a further G grace note on D, a held D, a connecting note of E before a doubling on D and a C, and a C grip to finish the line. I'll play the phrase, then I'll tell you what to look out for. I'll do that 
Symphony again. The first bar is pretty straightforward, the second bar is where you will see possibly about 40% of players coming from the D to the E and back to the D without putting the, the so through the, through the D to the E, sorry, and back to the D without putting the D down. It's a short E, but we must play a proper E as a full note. Uh, it's amazing how many pipers just leave that D up. It's a very, very quick E, uh, and it can be difficult to, 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 to concentrate on, but please play a proper E and not this E here. Again, that phrase... I hope after that that I actually played a proper E anyway. The first line, the, the first line of part two again, putting both phrases together. Okay, the second line in part two pretty much follows the same pattern as part one in that a large proportion of it uh, is exactly the same as uh, line one of part two. Where we part the ways is on the E in bar three. I'll show you what I mean here. <laughs> So, this first phrase is the same. And the closing two bars is where it changes. A G grace note to E, and connecting note of F before an E doubling, a strike. Holding the E, connecting note of D to a G grace note on C, followed by closing down to the low G for the throw in D, doubling on E, and finishing with a strike to E. Now don't forget that if your musical score does have the two starting notes outside the actual tune as an anacrusis, then we might be slightly astray here as, as far as bar formations go. The notes will be the same. So I might ask you to do a little two-note catch-up here and there, but uh, that, that, that doesn't make any difference to the way that we as pipers play the tune whatsoever. So having a look at that closing uh, two bars, or certainly closing phrase, Again, the main difference you're likely to find is that uh, the last C, um, the last C before that throw may well be held. It's even in this case. You might find that you finish the the tune. That's not what's written here. So we'll stick with. So having a look at the second part one more time. And if a band is going to finish on that E, you'll find that that E, uh, certainly in the repeat of the second part, will be quite abrupt, uh, almost to the point that the, the whole tune hasn't actually been played. But that's the way that bands finish. 
Let's then have a look at the full tune played with the repeats. Uh, again, this is Scott Scar's book one setting, page number 226. Uh, and it will also be quite an old edition of Scott Scar's book one, so I would not be terribly surprised if things have changed. However, this is my Scott Scar's book one. Uh, just be aware there might be slight differences. So. <coughs> Thanks very much. I hope all that made sense to you. Again, no apologies for repeating this. Uh, there are several different versions of this. Uh, please adapt as, as your band demands. One more time, this is in Scots Guards Book 1. And it also has the first two notes contained in the tune, not as an anacrusis. So, this has been lesson number 21 in our How to Learn the Bagpipe series and also video number 1500 in uh, the Falkirk Piping YouTube channel. One more time, uh, please, if you are enjoying these videos and even if you don't like them, please consider donating to Parkinson's UK. Uh, thank you very much and we'll see you for the next 1500 very shortly.